So there are activities and things and actions that we do, but I've got to come to this place in my heart of how I'm doing the intent of what I'm doing these things. Am I doing these things in order to promote myself? Am I doing these things in order to be accepted of God? Am I doing these things, you know, looking at myself for some kind of self-endeavor? Or am I looking at these things or doing these things that, that in order for Jesus to be exalted and glorified? Because listen, God's blessings for my life are much greater than anything I could possibly fathom for my life. Now, we have to have a dream and desire for our life, but as I said earlier, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Amen? So there's nothing wrong with having dreams and visions and desires, and, and, and we all need to have that. But I'm just saying God wants to give you his desires, his dreams, his passions for your life that are much greater than what we could even imagine for our own selves. Amen? Nothing wrong with having our own dreams and desires. Nothing wrong with enjoying our life and having fun and having recreational activities. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about being so religious, you know, that we're just boring. You know, that nobody wants to be around us. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about living a God-centered, Jesus-centered life, and that's fun. You know, Elsa and I have been traveling the world for, you know, almost 25 years now, and it's fun. Have, you know, is, is all the places that we go to, is it all comfortable? Do we have, you know, the best food? Do we have the best places to stay? No, not at all. A lot of times it's very uncomfortable, but I'm telling you, it's fun. I told her, I said, when this life is over and whoever goes first, if I go before you, I said, I'm going to say, or, hope, you know, if we go together, however it's good, I'm going to say, honey, this has been a great ride. We've had a lot of fun. No regrets. This life has been great. Now, i got a whole lot more to go. I've lived 61 years. I'm looking for 61 more. But my point is, you know, no regrets. We're having fun. We're enjoying ourselves in this life. And I'm saying that Christianity needs to be an enjoyable life. It doesn't need to be this life that just beats you down and we're so religiously, you know, in tune to the fact that, oh, oh we see somebody do something. We're so offended with that and we're so negative-minded. No, no, no. I see that as an opportunity for Jesus Christ to shine. Amen. Can I just say this to your friends? In loving and ministering to other people, people are just acting what they know. They're just living what they know. I'm not offended with new age people. I'm not offended with humanistic people. They're doing what they know. And how are they going to change? Well, I've got to be in contact with them, and I've got to love them and show them the love of God and show them Jesus Christ and something different than what they have, something that's better. Now, my intent in, in going to them is not, I'm, I'm going to convert you because you need to get what I got. No, my intent is to go to them because God loves them. See, we all need to answer this question, why do we do what we do? Why are we, why are we here in church? All right, why, why do I preach the word? Why do we go and pray for people? Why do we do anything that we do? We do it because of God's love. Because God loves us and he loves them. That's the motive of why we do everything. Not so that we can get anything out of it. God's going to take care of us. But I think every single Christian, every single minister, we need to come to the place of why are we doing what we're doing. And if it's not because of love, then we might as well not do it. Amen? Is that okay to say that? Well, I said it anyway. Now, in the case of Joseph we were talking about, it was because of God's grace, no matter where he went, he was elevated to a place of authority. And if you look at all the Old Testament saints before the law, God continued to bless them by grace in spite of their faults and in spite of their failures. Why? Because there was no law. Friends, do you realize that before the law came, God gave a covenant to Abraham, and that covenant was justification by faith. And everybody up until the law, until Exodus chapter 20, when the law was given, they were living under grace. God was blessing them mightily by grace, and they were messing up big time, more than we would even consider of messing up now as Christians. And God was continuing to bless them by grace. They had God's divine favor. So the potential for, is the same for everybody, but not everyone lives to that same level of faith. And that faith I'm talking about is the level of faith in the grace. It's a principle of life that you'll always live to the level of your faith. Amen? So we have to ask ourselves, is our faith in our ability or is our faith in Jesus and his ability? Because that's going to make all the difference in the world in living a victorious Christian life. Now, 
as we grow in our walk with God, we exercise more of that faith. And when I say grow in our walk with God, I'm going back to that scripture that I quoted in the beginning that Jesus grew in grace. What is our growth in our walk with God? It's a growing in grace. Amen. God has given us his grace, but there's a growing in that and growing in an understanding of that. Now, God doesn't give us more faith, but our faith is developed in it is greater used than our level of faith to the degree. Not when I say level, I'm not talking about uh, God giving us more, but our level of understanding and uh, using that faith and having that faith developed is dependent on our revelation of his grace. You know, we have a whole movement, Rennie, that's out there, you know, more faith, you know, everything is faith, 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 to the point where now faith is works. Why is that? Because they miss the grace. So if you want people's level of faith to be developed, preach grace. <laughs> preach the finished work. Preach Jesus, not themselves. Well, you gotta have no you gotta have more faith. If you don't have enough faith, that's why God didn't bless you. Now, faith is important. But it's something that God has already done. It's something he's already given us. So the issue now is not faith. The issue is now believe or just use the faith that you have. Amen. Now, again, that faith is going to be developed. And we're going to rise and increase and mature in our walk with God as we hear the message of God's grace. Amen. As we go, grow in our walk with God, and I say grow in grace, we exercise more of that faith. As we exercise our faith, we will always be shifting in a pattern of relationships in friendships now we have jesus for an example and so we see him at a young age and he's in the temple teaching and his parents go to him and they say you know jesus why are you worrying why are you worrying and he says don't you know i must be about my father's business and then later on as he gets on in his public ministry they say jesus your mother and your brothers are outside he said who's my mother and who my who are my brothers so you know everything that jesus did in his walk with god now hear me what i'm saying it cost him to a certain degree his relationships and his friendships. Now, my friends are my friends, period. And they will always be my friends. I'm talking about my involvement with them may not be the same. Uh, just for an example, you know, I had people that I, that I hung with before I was saved. And when I got saved, all of a sudden, you know, because I didn't go to the bars, because I didn't go out and drink, because I didn't go out and drug, because I didn't run around on my wife, you know, all of a sudden I was a square, <laughs> you know. All of a sudden now, I, I, I wanted to love my wife. I wanted to be home with my kids. I wanted to, to, you know, to live godly because that was something that God had instilled in me. But they were still my friends. I didn't treat them any differently. You understand what I'm saying? But because of that change in nature, change in lifestyle, and the desires that God had put in my heart, they were still my friends, but we, we just didn't hang together anymore. See, when they went out to party, you know, I was home and I was loving my kids and fellowshipping and doing other things. And then I was born again, and I was saved as a, as a Catholic man. And as I began to read the Bible, nothing wrong with the Catholics. I believe that they can be born again. I believe there are many are that are born again, filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm just talking about my own life. But as I began to read the Word of God, God led me out of that and into what you all know, you know, in a full gospel church. Let me say that. I won't say the denomination. And God led me into this full gospel church. As I began to grow in favor, grow in grace, grow in revelation knowledge and God took me out of that because I thought that one full gospel group that I was in was rather legalistic and it took me out of that and I felt that they were limiting God according to the word of God of what I was teaching they basically was a full gospel church they were basically a Baptist church that believed in speaking in tongues and sometimes God would and sometimes he wouldn't and you know we're just thrown this lot in life and we just got to barely get along and hopefully you know make it through this life and I just didn't see that in the word of God so we believed in speaking in tongues but you know we never experienced the power of God. We weren't even sure if the power of God was even going to be available to us if we were living right. So then I went into what we call a faith church. And so for nine years, we were in a faith church. And then God called me into a place of ministry. And when I got in a place of ministry, so the only thing I'm trying to make you is there were degrees and levels of my life where to go on with God, to grow in grace, it cost me certain, certain relationships. It cost me certain friendships. Now, as I said, those people are still my friends. If they call me tomorrow, I would be there to help them. It's just a matter of influence. And so it's, a, it's also the reason why some people don't grow. They allow their intimate friends to influence them against growing in grace. And again, I, I'm not telling anybody, you know, who to associate with and who not to associate with. I'm just telling you, now me, for me, I associate with everybody. I extend myself to everybody. 
but there's as far as my lifestyle there are think places that I don't go and things that I don't do and those are disciplines that I put on my life amen and it's not because it's not because I don't like those people it's just I just don't partake of certain things or certain things are not good for me let me say it that way right and so that cost me those relationships but those people are still my friends and I hope I'm communicating this to you in the right way all right now those people I'm not looking at them as evil but the Bible says this is first Corinthians 5 6 and 7 put it in the context of what I'm saying he says your glorying is not good know ye not that a little leaven leavens the whole lump it says purge out therefore the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you are unleavened for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us you know a lot of times I see this and I saw this um, recently in the last year or two there's been a, a, a mass exodus out of the church and uh, a lot of young people feel that you know the church is too legalistic I feel that too but in the name of freedom okay uh, what we said is well you know I can go into the bars and I can I can go and I can drink with them and I can do all that and, and again that's not a sin that's between you and God I'm not saying that my point was this I saw people do that I saw husbands and wives do that and I saw their marriages break up I saw all of a sudden the wife got an eye for some other guy I saw all of a sudden the husband got an eye for another woman and so in the name of well we can do anything we want because of God's grace because we're free they went in there and it cost them their marriage and they had kids involved and the end was very destructive now I use as an example not as condemnation because I believe people can go into those places can enjoy themselves maybe have those friends there not drink excessively again that's not a sin or people can go in there and they can uh, go in there to witness they can go in there to, to let their light shine I'm just saying you know you need to be graced to do that that's the only point I'm trying to say and for me personally I don't go into those places because God took me out of there and so he has to tell me to go back in there before I'm going to go back in there you understand what I'm saying amen so I'm not against people you know social drinking or even socializing or even going to those places that's between you and the and the Lord my only point is you know you just have to discern that for yourself okay let's leave that not go there any farther okay my point is you're, we're walking we're growing in grace and so who we let influence our life has a, a large degree of where we're going to go some people will discourage you because they you have a hunger to go on and experience new levels of truth and they do not you know I've had people say well don't go to that church you know they speak in those funny languages they believe in healing is still for today miracles are still for today imagine the belief that God will answer all of your prayers that's nonsense uh, I was had an online teaching on one of our grace teachings and I was teaching that we're not dual natured that we have one nature which the Bible teaches I mean I don't really know hardly anybody that teaches opposite of that there's a few you know most of your fundamental groups there's a few Pentecostal groups but most people that believe in the new creation preach that we have one nature and that's the spirit nature okay this is not your nature this is the body that you live in so we are a spirit we have a soul we live in a body so I was teaching online and one of our messages got online that we're not dual natured trying to encourage people trying to help people we have the nature of God and we can now live out of that nature of God well somebody put a comment on there you know that this is blasphemy this is heresy because they didn't believe because they didn't agree with that you know this teaching of that we have a one nature that we're not dual natured anymore and I thought about that and I thought wow you know what you're saying is really putting people in the bondage you're saying you're never going to be able to overcome you're stuck in the in the in the demonic nature you know from the beginning you're never going to get out of that and I thought you know here's what the Bible says you know knowing this our old man was crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed that we should no longer be slaves of sin I thought but well that's bringing freedom if any man's in Christ he's a new creation all things are passed away all things have become new so I'm just teaching this right along and it's blessing a lot of people but somebody put a comment on there and said no this is heresy and this is blasphemy and the point is again you know whatever it is that you put out there you know people will say don't go there don't do this don't participate in that and you know we have to discern all of that ourselves we have to see what is truth is it bringing freedom to your life and I'm saying this you know when Jesus said about uh, the gospel when he talked about this in Romans chapter excuse me John chapter 1 verse 14 and the word was made flesh 
and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the only glory of the only begotten Son of God, full of grace and truth. Can I say this to you, friends? The only truth there is is grace. The only gospel there is is grace. The only life there is to live is God's grace. It's either all of grace or none of grace. Amen? The issue and the problem in the church today is we got a mixture of law and grace. So sometimes we're in there trying to overcome and we're in there trying to do this thing and trying to make it happen. And I'm saying you don't have to do that. That's why Jesus went to the cross. That's why he defeated the devil. That's why he defeated sin. That's why he defeated the law. That's why he gave you a new nature. That's why he put himself inside of you. So now it's all by grace. It's all his divine favor. Now, rest. Walk with him. Live. Be joyful. Amen? In Acts 17 and 18, you didn't have to turn there, but when Paul went into Athens, there were certain philosophers in there. He said, what's this babbler saying? You know, they had all these men. With, you know, the, the Greeks were man-oriented, and they, they worshipped man, where we, where we would get our humanism today. And they worshipped man, and, 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 and Paul went in there, and he talked about Jesus and him being crucified, being the Son of God and raised from the dead. And they said, what's this babbler saying? These people were the philosophers of the day. And then Paul went on in Colossians 2.8, and he said, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy in vain deceit after tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Friends, can I just say this? If you don't get anything out of this morning, get this. God's blessings and provision are based on his faithfulness. They're based on his goodness. It's not based on you and what you do. Amen. Now, we do because he's already blessed us. We do because of his goodness. Amen. People have a tendency to be intimidated by other man's philosophies that are nothing more than rationalizations to justify failure. Well, sin and sickness, everybody's going to be sick sometime. You know, God doesn't heal everybody. That was Jesus. That's not you. You can't do that. See, when we accept the failures of other people, we partake of their failures. And I'm telling you, every single day we have a choice of all the things that happen to us and around us to take the focus off of Jesus, off of this word, off of what God said, and to put all the pressure on ourselves, to take all the burdens on ourselves, and to try to figure this out. What am I going to do? How am I going to get out of this? You know, I'm going to say this to you. The outcome of a situation may not turn out the way that you expect it to turn out. But it still ain't over. That's still not the end of it. And some people let that devastate the, the rest of their life. And I'm telling you, God's bigger than that. Your, your life is more important than that. Amen? Now, I expect the best out of every situation. And, and I, I can't see in the realm of the Spirit, and I don't understand every single thing. It doesn't take me off of the Word. It doesn't make me stop believing His Word. I have prayed for people that were sick and they died. It doesn't make me change to believe that God wants to heal every single person. Why do I do that? Because I know that by the Word of God, and I know that by the character of God. So by that, I have to steer myself and bring myself back into focus of what the Word of God says. That applies to every single area of our life. Amen? God didn't change, and His Word didn't change. I may not understand everything, but God didn't change and his word didn't change. And so if I just keep on walking, even though this present circumstance and situation doesn't appear to be right, maybe I didn't get the desired results, God's not done. He's not done with my life. Amen? That situation might not be able to be reversed, but my life can still turn around and still can be changed. Amen? The ministry that God uses through me can still be, still be changed. You know how many people are devastated through failed marriages? Divorce, uh, separation, you know, failed marriages, just devastated. Uh, infidelity. And, and just don't even want to go on in life. Some people even take their life. Well, you know, if they had, if they understood God's grace, if they understood his mercy, if they understood his divine favor. Now, you just presently got married, and you're going to live a happy life, and you're going to go on all your life and have a great, you got a great husband, and you got a great wife, and you're going to have beautiful kids, so I'm not talking to you. <laughs> but, you know, some people are better off. <laughs> oh, Pastor, you shouldn't say that. No, I'm in favor of marriage. I believe God, marriage is God's ordination. He, he destined that. But, you know, some people are better off. 
Let him go. Let that, let that guy go. Let that, go. let that woman go. They want to leave, let them leave. All they're doing is bringing you down, tearing you down, making your life miserable. Well, I have to stay married because, you know, this is the word of God. Well, you know, I believe in that. But we're living in a new covenant of grace. I'm not saying get out of your marriage. I'm not in favor of divorce. God hates divorce. I'm not saying that. But that's not the end. That's my point. It's not the end. God has a destiny for your life. And we've got to understand God's favor for all of that to happen, praise God. Now, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I don't know if you're getting anything out of this this morning. I'm kind of babbling. Now, I'm not going to read this. I have a lot I wanted to read, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to read this. But 2 Corinthians chapter 3 is all a contrast between law and grace. What am I talking about today? I'm talking about living victoriously in the Spirit and understanding that we have, this life that we are living is by God's divine favor. It's all by His grace. And if we don't get this, we are going to get so frustrated. You know, Paul said, he said, don't frustrate the grace of God. Don't get back over in your own self. Don't get back over in your own works. Don't get back under your own efforts. Don't get back under the law of do's and don'ts. Don't get back over into trying some kind of mind figuring this whole thing out. Stay in God's divine favor. Stay in his grace. Amen. We're saved by grace through faith. We continue by grace through faith. And we'll go into eternity by grace through faith. We're healed by grace through faith. We're delivered by grace through faith. We prosper. We're protected. Everything is by what Jesus already did at the cross. And now we live a life that we are in God's favor. You're God's favorite. I probably, we probably have to say that about 100 times to get our minds to be renewed to that every day because of all the stuff that's going on in our life. Amen. It's just a natural tendency for us to just want to get out of that. And we have a, 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 a world system, a social system that reminds us otherwise. Now, where did I say? 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Now, this whole chapter is a contrast between grace and law. And he says, listen, the law kills, it destroys, it brings destruction. And what is the law? It's what you do. It's your own efforts. It's those commandments written in stone. You know, I, if I said this in 95% of churches today, I would be kicked out. No, in our government today, so, oh, they took the Ten Commandments out of, out, of, out, of the, out of our system. Well, you know, I understand that as far, as far as law goes. It's okay to have that as far as law goes. You know, we have to have a, we can't have a lawless society. But in the church, we use that as our measuring standard for how to live our life. Our measuring standard for how to live this life is to surrender. <laughs> it's to give your life to Jesus and let him live his life through you. I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet, not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in this fleshly body, I live by the faith. Faith in what? Faith in him, faith in the grace, faith in the finished work. Verse 17 of 2 Corinthians chapter 3. So this whole thing is a contrast between law and grace. And Paul says, we're ministers not of the letter. The letter kills. We're ministers of the New Testament. Friends, listen. We're not just ministers of, of, of the New Testament. We're just not ministers of the Spirit. We live in the Spirit. Amen? We can't live according to the letter of the law anymore. There's no glory there. There's, there's no resurrection life or power there. There's no divine favor there. Verse 17, Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, freedom. But we all with unveiled face. Unveiled face is not looking through the law. Unveiled face is looking at Jesus. Unveiled face is coming face to face with grace, the personification of grace. Beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. We're being transformed from the same image into the same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of God. Now, where am I here? <laughs> okay. So God wants to change us by pouring out our lives from glory to glory. Now, just remember this. It was Israel that wanted to be judged by their merits. When they came out of the land of Egypt and Moses spoke to them, he said, listen, we, we want to do what the Lord says to do. And they said, we can do this. We, we can do what, the, what God demands. We're able to perform all that. And right after they said that, then the law came. See, the blessings, the provision, the power of God, they have never been by the law. It's always, 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 always been by 
God's grace, it's always by the person of Jesus Christ. Everything that they did, even under the law, which was a shadow of Christ to come. It was to point them to Christ. It was to show them that in their own deeds and in their own efforts, they could not achieve anything. They could not stand right in the sight of God. They could not experience His glory. It was all by what God had done for them, even under the law. Verse 18, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, were being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of God. Now, I'm just going to close with this. Don't let someone else's unbelief or rejection of truth or refusal to grow stop your life or your dreams. You grow with God. Amen? You grow in grace. You grow in truth. Now, again, grace is the truth. The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Do you understand what I'm saying? Jesus said, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. What am I saying? I'm saying that grace is the truth. Anything outside of grace is not the truth. Paul said that. He said, if any man comes and preaches any other gospel to you, he said, don't accept it. That, let that man be accursed. If an angel comes and preaches any other gospel of what I preach to you, the whole New Testament is a, is, is, is a testament of God's divine favor. How, how, how have you ever been so low or been so oppressed to the point that you just couldn't, you just felt like you just couldn't get out of the situation at areas in your life. Did you come out? <laughs> I mean, even unsaved people come out of these situations. But I'm just saying, God's how much more now with God's divine favor? But we've got to look that way. We've got to expect that. We've got to stay focused on that. We've got to realize our life is one great big divine favor. One great big gift of God's grace and that's the way we live 1 Corinthians 15 56 says this that the strength of sin is the law but thanks be unto God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ that's verse 57 so the sting of death is sin people when they come to the place of death Christian or non-Christian you know it's amazing to me how many people that I've been with Christians at the point of death that are afraid to go to be with the Lord. I mean, they've lived, I mean, I'm talking about people that have lived their lives, you know, in their 80s and have fought and fought and fought and come to the place and serve the Lord all their life and then come to the place of death and are afraid to go because they're not sure of their eternal destiny because they're still dependent on things that they did. And I've had to go in certain instances, yes, pray for them and believe God for their healing, but encourage them in the place of death that they're even saved because their minds never caught and never got renewed and never they never got the revelation of God's divine favor and of God's grace. They were still dependent on their own efforts in their own life. So the Bible says this, it says the sting of death is sin. And if that area of sin hovers over our life now in this present life or before we go on to the next life, I'm telling you, it's going to rob you of the glory of God that we are experiencing, that we can experience in this life. Um, people say this, can a Christian that's living, can he live a life that what the church would call maybe doesn't isn't a godly life? Can, can a Christian you know, commit sins? Uh, can, he, can he live a life that maybe you know, gets saved and then go back into a certain lifestyle? And, and, and can he still be saved after that? Well, let me ask you this question. Are you saved by faith in Jesus Christ and Jesus alone? Or are you saved by what you do? Now, here's the argument against that. They say, well, that life doesn't bring glory to God. Now, here's the misnomer with this, John. 
They're only measuring their life in the, in the years that they're here on this earth. But your life as being born again and saved is going to bring glory to Jesus throughout all eternity. And I'm just showing you how, how so legalistically, fleshly-minded, carnally-minded people are. Now, again, I'm, I believe in living a godly life, but that's all by the power of the Holy Spirit. But I, I don't get divine favor because of what I do. See, I, I could do everything right, cross every T and dot every I, but if I'm measuring that as my standard for God blessing me, then the person that's living in sin, that is truly born again, that is struggling and trying to overcome, God's favor will be measured more to them. Why? Because they're the humble and I'm the proud. Now, that's a hard pill to swallow. But, you know, I was, I've been in church a long time. And I have seen people faithfully come to church week after week after week and be in prayer meeting week after week after week and pay their tithes and do all the right things and live godly and experience nothing from God because they're expecting that because of their church attendance, because of their tithing, because of their living godly. And then I see somebody come in the church and <laughs> they don't know anything. They get saved and they're growing in the things of God, that the fact that they're still doing whatever they did before they were saved. And they're getting blessed abundantly. God is lavishing his, his wealth upon them. Why? Because they, they understand it's God's favor. They understand it's God's grace. And it's God's favor and his grace that's going to change their lifestyle. Amen? Are you with me this morning? The sting of death is sin. But the strength of sin is the law. The strength of sin is the law. Our own efforts, do's and don'ts. But God has given us divine favor. Now, death has no sting. Sin has no power over me. The law has no power over me now. Why? Because I'm living a life of God's favor. I'm living a life of God's grace. And that grace draws me to Jesus. That grace gets me to focus on Jesus. That grace gets me to focus on His faithfulness and His goodness. And now I'm not even considering that. I don't even, I'm not even considering that. I'm not even considering going here or doing this. Amen? And if I do, I'm not condemned in that. Praise God. I'm growing in grace. I'm growing into the fullness of Christ. Are you with me? So God's divine favor. This is, this is essential ingredient for being an overcomer. This is an essential ingredient in living the victorious life. We're overcomers. We're victorious whether we, whether we realize it or not. That's in our spirit, man. But to experience this, we've got to understand this divine favor that God has for us. Amen? See, you can sleep good at night. You, you can put your head in the pillow when your bills aren't paid, when your body's screaming at you. When, when society says, you know, this or that, when your wife's mad at you, well, I don't know, I don't sleep very good when my wife's mad at me. <laughs> you can know that you know that you know that God has got you. And his divine favor is working overtime in your life. You, know, you can't help but have a victorious life. So just, just trust God. Just delight yourself in him. He'll give you the desires of his heart. Commit your way also to him. Well, 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 well Lord, you know, I, I, I really would like to, 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 to find a, a nice girl that I can marry. I would really like to find that right man that would marry, that would love me and treat me as a queen and, and take care of me. And I, we could have a nice house and a home. I would really like to meet that man, you know, that, that, that loves God and would really be kind and generous. Commit it to the Lord. Commit it to the Lord. Lord, I'd really like to see this situation, you know, turn around. I'd really like to see it change. Commit it to the Lord. I'd really like to see this, this sickness and this disease go away. Okay, I prayed about it. I, I've dealt with it with according to the word. Now I commit that to you. What is prayer? Prayer is putting it in the hands of God. Amen. Well, well I want you to keep praying. I just put it in the hands of God. Why do you want me to keep praying? You want me to take it back? Is that, is that what you're saying? Prayer is putting it in the hands of the Lord. I, I can't change this situation. I can't make it better. So I pray. Whatsoever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive it and you shall have it. I have it. Praise God, I have it. Your body's screaming at you. The situation doesn't seem like it. Well, I want you to keep praying. I want you to pray harder. There, I just put myself right back in there. I didn't give it to God. I didn't trust God. 
I'm saying, God, you're not big enough to handle this. I've got to take this on, and I've really got to, I've got to, go, to, I've got to go to war. I've got to do something to make this thing happen. No, no, no. All I do is just prolong that thing. If I don't settle it, put it in the hands of the Lord, and then depend on his divine favor and his divine grace. You now, Paul said we are what we are by the grace of God. And he didn't take that grace of God in vain. Yet he labored more than them all. Well, I don't understand that. Paul said he labored. I thought you said it wasn't works. Listen to what he said. But it wasn't me that labored. It was the grace of God that labored through me. See, actually, with grace, you do more. But you're not doing it in your own strength. You're doing it in the strength of the Lord. It's God working through you. It's God exercising his strength through you. And that's the life, friends. This is the life that God wants us to live. It's a life of divine favor. Amen? I'm done. Praise God. Trust you got something out of this this morning. I'm talking about living a victorious Christian life. You know, if I went to 95% of Christians today and I asked them, what, what would you have to do to live a victorious Christian life? They would say, well, I have, to, I have to pray harder. I have to pray more. I have to read my Bible more. I have to fast longer. I guarantee you, I have to weed out these things in my life in order to win a victorious Christian life. And I'm telling you, when you understand God's grace and his mercy and his divine favor, then God takes care of all that stuff. He's the one that deals with it. And you just walk with him. And you enjoy that fellowship with him. Amen? Amen. Anybody here today, something you didn't understand, forgive my babbling this morning. Something I need to explain. Something I need to explain. Anybody have a question about anything? Anybody need ministry here? You're here this morning. You need ministry for anything? We're here for that. Um, was talking to somebody a week or two ago, and I said, you know, people don't respond very much to ministry. And then Tom came, and then everybody responded, came and let Tom pray for them. Now, I'm not offended with that, but I don't want to instill in you in everything that we teach. It's done. It's complete. Jesus completed it all. But I don't want to instill in you that I'm not here and we're not here to pray for one another. And it's not a sign of lack of faith or a detriment against your character if you want help and you need prayer for anything, okay? Well, I'm just putting that out to you. I'm not trying to compel you to come forward or make you feel guilty because you need prayer. I'm just trying to make a point. You know, yes, it's all there, but the Bible still encourages us to pray. The Bible says God already knows what we need, yet he tells us to ask. Amen? So there is a part of us asking and receiving. Yes, brother? Okay. So in Jesus' name right now for Cindy, Lord, we just decree life and strength and health. Right now we come into agreement as a body of Christ. We say this sickness goes no longer. That even now as we pray and speak God's word, the life of God flows into her. It wells up out of her innermost being. Drives out all weakness and all sickness. And we thank you, Father, that Cindy is well and strong and healed. By your grace, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. For in Jesus' name, we decree those eyes to be restored to normal for Janice Yelk down there in Howard, in Jesus' name. We say eyes be healed. All the symptoms of, of, of those weakness in her eyes to go right now. I say be restored. Be normal in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you. Thank you. For the power of God in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Anybody else? See that? Just a little encouragement and and people ask for prayer. That's okay, friends. It's all right. All right? Now, if you don't have any more questions, I know it's Father's Day. I want to wish you all a Father, happy Father's Day. I just want to just give this opportunity. You know, does anybody, you know, uh, you're here. Well, you're you're, you're not, but uh, actually this only applies to one person. If you want to say something, it doesn't. Actually, really, you can, you can say something. It doesn't. Your dad doesn't have to be here. But if, if I'll give you an opportunity, if you want to say something about your dad, uh, I'll just start off. Okay. Um, my dad was a very austere man, and I was brought up to be seen and not heard. And uh, so, you know, we were very well-behaved kids. And usually, when I walked by my dad. I had one hand behind my head and one hand on my backside because I either got slapped behind the head or a boot in the rear. 
every time I walked by him. And if I ever did something wrong, it, it was a it was a beat. And you know, like we had to be home on time for supper. And if I wasn't home on time for supper, uh, I was get a beat. And so again, very disciplined life. Um, but my dad loved me, and and that's all he knew of how to show his love. Okay, he was always there for me. I could always, as I grew older, I could talk to him. I could go to him. But he was an austere man. He wasn't one of these guys that would hug you or anything like that. Well, when we got saved, and the kids got saved, we we'd go visit him. And we would hug him, and it, it just changed. He even let us pray for him. He wouldn't let me talk about Jesus too much. He was a Catholic man. And uh, he, he never one time came to one single service that I ever preached or never when I got ordained, any of that. He never involved himself in any of that. And I would go on mission trips, and I'd come home, and I'd tell him about it. And he said, why you got to go all over there? Why you got to go over there? I said, well, there's people over there that need the gospel. He goes, what are you trying to do, save the world? And he just didn't relate. Okay, so for him, he, had, he was like a, a, a Gnostic or an agnostic sort of, you know, he, he believed that there was a God, but he didn't really believe, you know, that you had to receive Jesus to be Lord and save, to be born again, even though he went to a Catholic church. And so I remember uh, it was six days before his 80th birthday, and my dad was a very robust guy, very strong all his life, never sick, worked hard all his life. And to this day, I wouldn't have messed with him even when he was 79 years old. He probably would have kicked my butt. But I remember I had come back from a mission trip, and I went, then I went home. I lived about 120 miles from him. And as soon as I got home, my brother called me and said, Dad's been diagnosed with cancer. And so I drove right back up. And I went to the house, and I said, Dad, I said, I love you. I said, you've always been there for me. I said, but I'm not leaving this house till you get saved. <laughs> and I had told him about Jesus how many times. I said, I know where I'm going. I said, I want to make sure you're there. I said, and I'm going to fight with every strength of every bit of, you know, spirit of God that's in me, just the opposite of what I taught you, <laughs> to keep you alive, to see that you live this life. I said, but I'm not leaving this house till you get saved. And so Dad gave his life to Jesus, wept the pool of tears, and generally got saved right there. The very that very night, he was given a, a, a an injection for pain. Went to a coma, and four days later he was gone. And so again, uh, he didn't make his 80th birthday. I know I'm going to see my dad, you know, in heaven. Uh, that does go with what I what I preach. It's not over till it's over. And so I never gave up. And uh, on, on dad, and he was a good man, and I, and I thank the Lord for that. I have only fond memories, you know, the beatings and all that, that's okay, that was good, you know, I did, no big deal. But uh, he was a really good man, he was a, a husband of one wife, uh, and he was a, a good man. I thank God he actually eventually got saved. So thank the Lord for dad. Dad, you're in heaven, I don't know if you're hearing me right now, I'll see you someday, and that's what the testimony I want to give. Anybody, you want to say anything about your dad? Give glory? or just honor, or just something of a respect. I think it's a great thing. I won't force you to do that, but if you do, you can do that. Anybody? Yeah, real quick, Dawn. I, I grew up together with a relationship with my mother. Say louder so everybody yeah. can hear you. Yeah. Right. Does change everything. Yeah. Uh -huh. I like the guy. <laughs> I have a good relationship with him. I just need to get around him a little more. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Right. Amen. 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 Praise.
praise God. Anybody else? Real quick, last chance, give a testimony. I got a, I got a nice email from my daughter this morning again. She sent me an email. Thank you, Dad, all this. My son called me last week and wished me a happy Father's Day. I said, uh, it's not Father's Day. It's not until next week. He said, well, I'll call you again. You know, <laughs> I'll call you again next week. And so uh, if your dad is still uh, alive and you can contact him today, do that. Believe me, it means the world to them. I can't tell you what it means <laughs> to me. I, I have regrets, you know, but I can't go back and change that. And when my kids say, Dad, I love you, I appreciate you to be there, whatever they say, <laughs> you know, it means a lot. So if you have a father, contact them today. Tell them how much they love them. Do something nice for them. Praise God. It, it, it's worth it. You know, think of your heavenly father. Praise God. You know, that, that's really the key to everything. And that's really, you know, it's, it's that picture of the heavenly father that propels me to, to, to live this life and to be the father that God has called me to be. But I can't do that again without God's grace and without his favor. So praise God. Do we want to do something? Oh, we're going to receive. I didn't receive an offering. So if you want to bring your offering up, you can do that. Again, I'm not going to teach on that or anything. If you make out an offering envelope or if you make out a check, make it out to Dominion Life. Uh, your your offering is important. We, we really need, you know, offerings to continue on and do what we need to do. And so anything that you can do is greatly appreciated. I, I really appreciate it. You know, sometimes we... We think that $5 doesn't really matter, but it does, you know. So anything that you can do is greatly appreciated. And so, again, we're blessed because of God's grace. And so thank you very much for your faithfulness, your commitment. And, Father, I just pray for everybody, you know, for their faithfulness, for their kindness, for their giving. I just decree favor in their life. It's already there. I decree God's favor in their life. And, Father, for this church, I pray for growth, for increase. For everybody that's here, everybody that calls us their home, everybody that's coming in, everybody that's coming and going, everybody that's, that's going to come in, I just pray and I just thank you, Father. I thank you for their faithfulness, their commitment. I thank you for your divine favor in their life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. We are free. Enjoy your day. Praise God.